You see, when we derived uh, Rutherford's model and uh, looked at the results of Rutherford's experiments, we used the Coulombic interaction in order to find the distance of closest approach of a helium nucleus with the nucleus of an atom. And in 1887, Hertz had produced the electromagnetic wave. Radio was being invented and uh, the electromagnetic spectrum was being unfolded. So how does a radio actually work? And how are electromagnetic waves produced? Could anyone give me an answer? How do you produce electromagnetic waves or radio waves? You produce them or transmit them through an antenna. Now how does an antenna work? Right, so you have accelerating charges. So an antenna basically is something like the following. <coughs> you have function generator that gives you an AC, AC field. and charges oscillate along this antenna wire. So at a certain instance of time, the top half is positively charged, the negative half, the bottom half is negatively charged. At another instance of time, the top half is negatively charged, whereas the bottom half is positively charged. So this rapid flip-flop of charge between the upper wire and the lower wire, this is the antenna by the way, produces an electromagnetic wave and this electromagnetic wave propagates outwards in space and the frequency of this wave f exactly matches the frequency of the function generator and it actually matches the frequency at which these charges flip flop between the bottom and the top halves of the antenna. So we have accelerating charges that are producing or radiating electromagnetic waves. Likewise, <coughs> Rutherford had proposed that in the center of the atom there is a positively charged nucleus. The atomic number had been discovered, so if Z is the atomic number, E is the charge on the nucleus, Z E is the total charge, positive charge on the nucleus. But the atom is stable and it's electrically neutral. So if you have an electron that is outside the nucleus, which was predicated by Rutherford's model, this electron must be experiencing an attractive Coulombic interaction with the nucleus. So Coulomb's force was the order of the day. The electromagnetic force was the order of the day. Gravity had been discovered. Electromagnetic forces had been discovered. Not the strong and the weak nuclear forces. But the Coulombic interaction had been discovered and Rutherford did not dare questioning the Coulombic interaction. <coughs> he did not dare questioning the Coulombic interaction. He believed in this 1 over r square dependence of the Coulombic interaction. As Newton had believed in the 1 over r square dependence of the gravitational attraction. So this Coulombic interaction between the negatively charged electron and the positively charged nucleus results in an inwards force acting on the electron and if the electron is actually spiraling around the nucleus it will continually decrease its radius until it finally drops into the nucleus and the atom therefore as a result must be unstable the electron must eventually fall into the nucleus and if you have an atom which is stable for its say and the electron is revolving 
So the, the first problem with Rutherford's model is the stability of the atom. Why is the atom stable? The second problem, which Rutherford could not explain, because he had firm faith in Coulombic interaction, and Hertz had shown that oscillating charges produce electromagnetic waves, is that when an electron is revolving around the nucleus, it must be accelerating, because it's revolving in circular orbits. And when we have circular motion, there is some acceleration. So why does not an atom, on its own, radiate electromagnetic waves. So you have an atom, it must be continuous, continually exciting electromagnetic waves, producing electromagnetic waves with a certain frequency. So the second question that Rutherford was unable to answer is why does an atom continually emit electromagnetic radiation? All right. So this is the background. Now, let's talk a, a little bit about some experiments that were being performed. <clears throat> if we have a discharge tube, and these experiments were performed by two German scientists. One was Kirchhoff, whom we call Kirchhoff, the famous person whom we mentioned in the first lecture, who, who talked about the rate of absorption and emission of thermal radiation and the same Kirchhoff after whom are named the Kirchhoff's current and voltage law with whom you are all familiar. So the same Kirchhoff and his colleague Bunsen in Germany were performing these experiments. Does anyone know uh, what Bunsen is famous for? It's famous for the Bunsen work. Alright, so their experiments were actually <coughs> Of, of this form, they had an evacuated glass tube and inside the glass tube, they were able to produce a large electric field and they could fill in some gas inside this tube. The gas would come in and gas would go out. So they could adjust the pressure of the gas and they could have low and high pressures of gases inside this discharge tube. They placed a barrier in which there was a small slit. They had a prism and a screen placed in front. So radiation came out, light came out of the discharge tube. It went out in all directions, but the barrier stopped the radiation and only allowed a small <coughs> beam of light to go straight through. The prism diffracted the lines, separated the lines, and at the end, on the screen, they observed discrete lines. So this is a discrete spectrum, and it's called a discrete line spectrum. But from Planck's work, from Planck's work, we already know that if we plot versus frequency or wavelength, the, the uh, energy density or the emitted intensity, we would get not a discrete spectrum, but a continuous spectrum. This is what Planck had. This is what Planck works with. And we've discussed this in detail. So from solids or gases that are heated, and they are at, in a state of thermal equilibrium, we don't get a line spectrum. Rather, we get a continuous spectrum. So the question remains, what is the origin of the discrete line spectrum? And this is a question that we aim to, that Bohr aimed to answer. So there's a difference between a continuous spectrum and a line spectrum. <coughs> from a hot gas, from a hot gas in a state of thermal equilibrium, we would get a continuous spectrum. And from gases that are subject to an electrical discharge, 
we get discrete line spectra. So what is the origin of the line spectra? Alright, if you remember from Planck's work, Planck posited that the atoms that made the wall of the cavity, their motion or their energy is quantized. He could not come up with the model of what that motion is. He could simply state that the energy of the oscillation is quantized with a quantum number n. And whenever an atom made a transition from n to n minus 1, it emitted radiation and then Einstein came in. And Einstein said that whenever this transition happened, a photon of energy HF is emitted inside the cavity. Now Bohr went a step further and he presented the details of what the harmonic oscillator, that is what the atom is actually doing. All right. So this is a discrete line spectrum and it is of course an emission spectrum. This is something that we are all very well aware of, so I will not go into the details. But remember that this form, this area of physics which is called spectroscopy. is a fundamental area in physics. And in fact, spectroscopy is our window to the universe. Hum zameen par rehte hai. Zameen ke bahar kaise dekhte hai? Hamari nazar to mehdood hai. We can only see a certain distance. But how do we look into the stars? How do we know that stars have a certain composition? How do we know that the stellar dust in between the stars which permeates the universe has a certain composition? This is with the help of spectroscopy. How do we know that the atoms that make up our bodies, hydrogen, carbon, phosphorus, nitrogen, calcium that makes our bones, iron that is in our blood, the calcium that is in our teeth, the water that is all over in our body, the hydrogen and oxygen that is. How do we know that the same elements exist inside the universe? And there is nothing special about us, about us composition wise. How do we know that? We know it through spectroscopy. We know that sodium exists on the, on the stellar dust that surrounds the sun. How do we know that? Because of spectroscopy. How do we know that, hydro, that there are certain stars that are just uh, uh, burning masses of hydrogen? How do we know that? Because of spectroscopy. So there were a large number of experiments that were being performed on spectroscopy. And one kind of spectroscopy is emission spectroscopy. And this is, this is the kind of work that is done in emission spectroscopy. In absorption spectroscopy, now how does absorption spectroscopy work? Suppose this is sodium vapor in here. Now you get the absorption, uh, the emission spectrum of sodium. Now if you have a flame in between the <coughs> slit and the prism, And you have a little bit of sodium salt sprinkled in here inside the flame. These lines will actually, the bright lines will actually darken a little. So in an emission spectrum we have a dark background and on a dark background we have bright lines because the sodium inside the discharge tube is emitting radiation of precise discrete wavelengths. But if you have sodium vapor in between, some of these lines will be darkened a little bit. And that is because the sodium is absorbing some of the radiation that is emanating from the excited sodium. But not, not all of the lines will be darkened. And this I will ask as a homework. So you have an emission spectrum and you have an absorption spectrum, which are dark bands on a bright background. And this is in fact the prin working principle of an atomic absorption spectrometer. So, you can see emission and absorption spectroscopy in the details of 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 the details 
set out to analyze. And in order to <laughs> analyze these experiments, you had to make an all-out revolt against Coulombic interactions and, and Maxwell's electrodynamics. All right, by the way, spectroscopy, before spectroscopy, before the advent of spectroscopy, it was generally believed that something that is extraterrestrial, something that is extraterrestrial outside our planet Earth is holier than us. soil and make our earth, make the entire universe. In fact, 99% of the universe is just hydrogen, the same thing that. So hydrogen spectroscopy played a very important role. Now what was Bohr's work? Bohr actually showed that inside the atom there is a nucleus <coughs> of a charge plus Be and electrons are revolving in circular orbits inside the atom. So there is an electron. An electron belongs to a certain orbit. Orbit ka matlab is ek chakkar hai. So the electrons revolve in circular orbits around the nucleus. You have already studied this, by the way, so this is just a recap. And when the key contribution of Bohr is that when the electron is revolving inside an orbit, it is accelerating. Of course it is accelerating because its velocity is not constant. Mechanics tells us that there has to be some acceleration. But despite the fact that it is accelerating, it does not re-radiate or it does not radiate out any radiation. Its energy remains fixed. The energy remains fixed. So you have different orbits and an electron belonging to one orbit has a constant energy and that energy is given by <coughs> NHF. And whenever an electron makes a transition from one orbit to the other, is a photon emitted. Einstein had already shown that photons exist. So a photon is emitted whenever the transition takes place and the energy carried away by the photon is equal to the difference in energy between the two levels. Final minus initial is n final minus n initial h. So this is Bohr's energy postulate. And the most striking postulate presented by Bohr is that the angular momentum of the electron L is <coughs> quantized. Which means that the angular momentum which is simply n v r, where v is the speed, r is the radius of a particular orbit, m is the mass of the electron, is quantized. And something be quantized means that it can only take up discrete values. And those discrete values are n h bar, where h bar is h over 2 pi. So this is the most radical postulate of now what is the origin of this postulate and how does everything gel together in a complete unified picture? This is what Bohr had shown. So Bohr led away with the idea that an accelerating charge emits radiation. The charge is accelerating even though it is in a fixed orbit but it is not radiating any energy and a photon is emitted or absorbed only when what he called transitions take place. 
three green energy levels. And with the help of this picture, Planck's ideas started to make sense. That is, the atoms inside the walls of the cavity, they are in fact atoms uh, which had electrons, and electrons were making transitions between orbits. And when they made transitions between or their orbits, they emitted radiation. And the radiation was in the form of photons, as Einstein showed, and they carried discrete amounts of energy. And those photons could also be absorbed by the atoms. So Bohr's picture now gave the idea that atoms interact with photons, and interactions between atoms and photons can take place. And everything is now quantized. All right. Now there are certain beautiful corollaries of Bohr's model and you've already studied them so we'll just skim through them. The first corollary is that even though the atoms are in fixed orbits, those orbits are fixed. That is not all orbits are possible. Another way of saying is this, is that R is quantized. That the electron can exist only at certain distances from the nucleus. And the region in between the orbits is what is called forbidden territory for the electrons. The region in between the orbits is forbidden. An electron can only exist on one orbit or the other or the third orbit, but it cannot exist between orbits. So what happens between transition is something, it's a philosophical question. Whenever an electron is making transition from one orbit to another, where does the electron exist? Now it's not legitimate to ask this question presently because quantum mechanics provides you the solution, but anyways, you run into a lot of philosophical problems when you say that R is quantized, but R indeed is quantized. And how do we prove that R is quantized? We do a simple mechanical calculation. And the calculation goes as follows. When the electron is revolving around the nucleus, there is a certain centripetal force, mv square r. That centripetal force is provided by Coulombic interaction. So again, Bohr used the Coulombic force even though he had shown that the Coulombic force does not let the electron fall into the nucleus. But once the electron is revolving in an orbit, the centripetal force is being provided by Coulombic interaction. And that Coulombic interaction is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught z e square over r square. So, R ki quantization of derive kar sakte hai, bilkul kar sakte hai. Let's derive it. Ye M kis cheez ka mass hai? Electron ka mass hai.
all right. <coughs> so n is an integer. n can take a values 1, 2, 3, 4 and so on. The other constants here are fundamental constants. h bar is the fundamental constant, m is the mass of the electron, the charge of an electron. So r is depending upon n. So I can put small, small n here. To show that R is quantized and its quantization is determined by this this parameter n. And parameters like this are called quantum numbers. This is a quantum number. <coughs> so now we know that R n is n squared, z squared, and some other constant, let's call it a naught, with a naught is with a naught is 4 by epsilon naught h bar squared over m e squared. So if you increase the value of n, the radius increases as a square. And this number is called the Bohr's radius, we all know that. And it's of the order of 0.529 angstroms. So this is the radius of the smallest orbit corresponding to n equals 1, <coughs> a naught. And when we study quantum theory formally, we will <coughs> see that all of this breaks down. But this is Bohr's model. So the main result is that the radius is quantized. The first orbit will be at a certain distance from the nucleus. The second orbit will be at a certain distance from the nucleus. The third orbit will be at a certain distance from the nucleus. And the spacing between the orbits is growing quadratically because it is an n square term. Okay? The spacing between the orbits is growing quadratically. Another important result is that the energy is quantized. We know that the energy is quantized. And do you remember how to derive the quantization of the energy formula? Have you studied it? Let me ask this question. Now tell me, in this case, you have to answer the question. Tell me, do I do it in class or do I do it in class? Should I go through the details in the class? Yes. No, sir. All right. We know that the radius is quantized. And what have we used? We've used the fact that the centripetal attraction is provided by electrostatic forces and that the angular momentum is quantized. Now we know that the energy of the electron is half mv squared plus, which is minus, c e squared over 4 pi epsilon naught r. This is the electrostatic interaction. This is the kinetic energy. This is a potential energy. Okay? So this is a well-known formula. We can insert the value of r from what we derive. We can eliminate the speed of the electron. And we will find I, find that the energy also depends upon n. So can you do this calculation at home? Yes. Be able to do this calculation. And the final result that we get is So this you can do as a homework and I will not belabor you with the derivation here, it's just 
some algebra. Now here, we've already shown that the radius is quantized. This is what Bohr's model predicates. Now we've seen that the energy of the electron is quantized. So whenever the electron is in a particular orbit, that is, it has a certain quantum number, and its radius is quantized, it cannot exist in between orbits, and its energy is also quantized. And the energy has this relationship. It is varies inversely as n squared and it is negative. So whenever an electron is bound to the nucleus, it is inside the atom, its energy is negative. And this term, this term, you can calculate the numerical value and you all know that this is 13.6 electron volts. And you have a z squared depending upon whether you are talking about hydrogen or some other nucleus. <coughs> and this is simply the ionization potential of hydrogen. So if we draw a mental picture of the energy levels, the lowest energy level is n equals 1 and it has an energy of minus 13.6 electron volts. And as you go higher in energy, as you go higher in orbits, that is the principal quantum number goes up, n squared goes up, this term decreases, there is a negative sign, so your energies become closer towards the positive axis. And as the n goes even higher, the spacing between these energies starts shrinking until you reach n equals infinity. At n equals infinity, the energy is zero. And what does n equals infinity mean? The electron has gone out of the out of the atom, or the atom has been ionized. So this, I think, is minus 10.8 electron volts, and so on. This is n equals two, n equals three, and so on. And the region above is called the continuum. <coughs> this is where the electron comes out of the confines of the nucleus and becomes a free electron. Okay? The electron is now a free electron. If you give it enough energy, greater than 13.6 electron volts, greater or equal to 13.6 electron volts, the atom can be ionized and the electron is now free. So this energy separation is the ionization energy. The lowest order ionization energy. You can have first order, which is the separation between these levels. You can have second order ionization energy and so on. But for hydrogen, only the first order ionization energy makes sense. So this is the Bohr's model. The energies are quantized, the radii are quantized. <coughs> And I will also ask a question in the homework that the velocity is also quantized. And I will ask whether the velocity is relativistic or not. Any questions so far? So this is very basic stuff. Is it all making sense and does it ring some bells that we've already studied this? Okay. Now a few <coughs> finer details. The first detail is how do we connect this to spectroscopy? Now whenever a transition between levels takes place, energy is emitted. Suppose you start off with <coughs> an electron is in a state Ni, it falls into a state Nf, we know that a photon is emitted of energy Ni minus Nf into Hf. This is the energy of the emitted photon. Let's call it delta E. So delta E should simply be equal to Ei minus Ef. But we already know what the energies are. So delta E has to be equal to 
minus z squared m e4 32 a bar squared pi squared epsilon naught squared 1 over m i squared minus 1 over m f squared but this is equal to h f and this is equal to h c over lambda I can also write h bar squared as h squared I can remove this pi squared <coughs> I can put as 8 8 h squared h bar h over 2 pi cube jamais which means that 1 over lambda which is the wavelength of the emitted radiation equals minus z squared m e4 a h q c epsilon naught squared 1 over n i squared minus 1 over n f squared which is I can put a plus, plus sign here make this n f make this n i so this is the wavelength of the emitted radiation This constant, <coughs> this constant is given a special name. It's called the Rydberg constant for hydrogen. Rydberg's constant for hydrogen. It has a certain value, 1.0974 into 10 to the power 7 per meter. And when we are talking about emitted radiation, Nf and Ni, both we know they are both integers and Nf is greater than Ni. If Ni is 3, Nf has to be 4, 5, 6 and so on. So depending upon what the final destination of the electron is, you can get wavelengths of different radiation and you can assign different series. For example, you have the Lyman series, Palmer, Fashion, Rapid, Fun, and so on. So this is something that you can read on your own. But the key is that if you look at the spectrum of an atom, for example hydrogen, if you look at the spectrum of hydrogen, you get a certain line we take a hydrogen ke line spectrum ki baat kare and this is the wavelength scale you excite hydrogen and it emits radiation and these, this radiation must be emitted as discrete lines. This is what Bohr's model is showing us. So there will be a certain wavelength which corresponds to Ni equals to Nf equals 1. electron can make a transition into n equals 1 from n equals 2 from n equals 3 from n equals 4 from n equals 5 and so on. This is called the Lyman series. An electron can make transitions into n equals 2 from upper levels and this is called the Balmer series. And you get a series of wavelengths and all of these have to be discrete frequencies, discrete wavelengths. And you can plot these discrete wavelengths on 
a spectrum or on a screen, what you will observe is that the spacing between these lines gradually decreases until you get a continuous spectrum from here on. And this point is the continuum limit. So you get an age alpha line which corresponds to a transition from n equals 2 to n equals 1. You get an age beta line which corresponds to a transition from n equals 3 to n equals 1 and so on. So these spectra are in fact fingerprints of atoms. And this is how you detect atoms, detect elements. In fact, there are two elements, at least rubidium and cesium, that were detected by spectroscopy. Neon will have its own spectrum, argon will have its own spectrum, xenon will have its own spectrum, carbon will have its own spectrum. So these are fingerprints of molecules and this is how you detect atoms and molecules and elements. So this is all I have to say about Bohr's model but a few interesting observations. The first observation, suppose When, when the hydrogen atom was being observed, the spectrum for the hydrogen atom was being observed, this line, the H alpha line, was in fact shown to be composed of two distinct lines which are very close together. The H beta line was shown to be composed of two distinct lines which are very close together. So each discrete line is in fact a doublet. All right. So whenever we have two lines that are closely spaced in frequency or in wavelength, your instrument that is detecting the doublet has to be precise enough to resolve between those two lines. Suppose you have two peaks that are very close together. If you have a poorly resolved instrument, you will not be able to see the individual lines. What you will actually observe is a broad peak. So in order to perform these experiments, a very sensitive spectrograph was used. A very sensitive spectrometer was used that could look at the separation between these lines. Now it was observed that each of these lines in hydrogen's discrete spectrum was in fact a doublet. Okay. Doublet. Is he kya origin also? You have hydrogen in a gas, you have hydrogen gas inside a discharge tube, and you're looking at the spectrum. Or you're looking at the absorption spectrum from the sun. The sun has hydrogen. Fraun Hofer was performing these experiments. Now each line is in fact a doublet. What could be the origin of this doublet? Hydrogen may? So on say two atoms of H2. Achha, you know, ye swal ka ye jawab diya hai ki hydrogen gas dharasal diatomic hoti hai. Iske andar do atoms hoti अब ये देखे एक सवाल इन्होंने पूछा इससे मैं एक सवाल पूछूं हाइड्रोजन गैस के अंदर हाइड्रोजन गैस में ये डायटॉमिक फॉर्म में एक डिस्चार्ज ट्यूब में पड़ी हुई है तो क्या जो दो डिफरेंट हाइड्रोजन एटम्स और मॉलिक्यूल उनका स्पेक्ट्रम डिफरेंट होगा नो यू विल ऑब्जर्व जस्ट वन लाइन ठीक है सो यू हैव यू हैव ओजोन ओ3 ओ3 को प्राइजेंस टू ऑक्सीजन एटम्स Will the spectrum of ozone, the electronic spectrum of ozone be different from a single oxygen atom? No. So that's not the answer. Exactly. The reason is that hydrogen has two isotopes. Okay? Hydrogen has two isotopes and what are they? They are? One say isotopes hydrogen. Normal hydrogen, dusra? Anyways, we have these isotopes of hydrogen. And how are isotopes different from one another? 
different number of neutrons. So in this formula, do we have the mass of the proton or the number of protons? The number of protons is z, but both hydrogen and deuterium have the same value of z. M is the mass of the electron. Does having an isotope have some effect on the spectrum? At least by observing the formula. This is the formula for the wavelength. Can you measure R and have an isotope effect? Yes. So different isotopes ki se zahir ho raha hai ke you should observe the same spectrum from hydrogen and deuterium. However, there is a problem with Bohr's model. And the Bohr's model assumes that you have a very heavy nucleus, a very heavy nucleus of mass capital M and a small electron of mass small m revolving around the nucleus. And the assumption is that this is fixed in space. The position of the nucleus is fixed because the nucleus is so heavy. But that's not true. If you consider this system as a binary system, binary system as a system which can have two masses involved, a capital M, a small m. What is the moment of inertia? Suppose this separation between these two bodies is small a. How do you find the moment of inertia of this system? Now one can argue that if the electron is revolving around the nucleus, another person could argue that the new electron is fixed and the nucleus is revolving around the electron. So in this system, there is a center of mass. And where is that center of mass? That center of mass is close to the center of the atom because M is so heavy. Okay? And the distance is small r. That is the distance from the center of the atom. What is small r equal to? Small r would be equal to, in terms of A, Can you find the center of mass of this system? Simple question, mechanics. is much larger than small m, r approaches 0. If m and small m are the same, that r equals 1 a by 2, which means that the center of mass is in between m and small m. Is this formula making sense? This is the position of the center of mass of this binary system. ये दो मासेस हैं, दोनों का मास स्मॉल एम है, तो इनका सेंटर ऑफ मास कहाँ पे लाइक करेगा? इन बिटवीन, ठीक है? दिस इज ए बाय टू, दिस इज ए बाय टू, दिस इज द पोजीशन ऑफ द सेंटर ऑफ मास। नाउ इफ दिस इज अ हेवियर बॉडी, दिस इज अ लाइटर बॉडी, कैपिटल एम एंड स्मॉल एम, द सेंटर ऑफ मास विल लाइक क्लोजर ट 
क्या प्रिंसिपल ऑफ मोमेंट्स इस्तेमाल कर रहे हैं यूज द प्रिंसिपल ऑफ मोमेंट्स यू कैन फाइंड द पोजीशन ऑफ द सेंटर ऑफ मास नाउ यूजिंग एग्जैक्टली द सेम टेक्निक दिस इज द पोजीशन ऑफ द सेंटर ऑफ मास ऑफ दिस बाइनरी सिस्टम एंड द मोमेंट ऑफ एनर्जीया इज इक्वल टू व्हाट इज द मोमेंट ऑफ एनर्जीया नाउ इक्वल टू ओके इन जनरल व्हाट इज द मोमेंट ऑफ एनर्जीया ऑफ अ मास रिवॉल्विंग With the radius of gyration r, mass times r square. ये तो याद होगा ना आपको, ठीक है? अब यहाँ एक r square आएगा और एक effective mass आएगा, mu, which is called the reduced mass of the electron. नहीं समझ आ रही कुछ समझ नहीं आ रही तो ये तो ए लेवल में या मैकेनिक्स में पढ़ा होगा ना मोमेंट ऑफ एनर्जी कैसे कैलकुलेट करें अभी हमारा फोकस इलेक्ट्रॉन पे है इफ The electron is seeing a very heavy nucleus. The reduced mass of the electron is the same as the mass of the electron, and the formula holds true. So we talk about the reduced mass of the electron. ये बात समझ आ रही Used. Is this making sense to you? Very simple stuff. I can see blank faces here. आप बताइए कि is this all making sense or it's just out of this world? हम तो आप पीछे बैठे हैं आपने. It's not making sense. समझ नहीं आ रही. देखो सेंटर ऑफ मास की पोजीशन की बात समझ आ रही है इस सेंटर ऑफ मास एक बाइनरी सिस्टम का एक सेंटर ऑफ मास होता है यू हैव टू ऑब्जेक्ट एम वन एम टू दिस डिस्टेंस इज आर This distance is a minus r. The separation between these two objects is a. M1 and M2 are different masses. This is the position of the center of mass. The moment of inertia of this system will be given by M1 r squared plus M2 a minus r squared. Is this making sense? Yes, sir. This is the moment of inertia of the system. Center of mass we find that. If center of mass were in between, let's see what this, what happens if r equals a over two. That is, when m one equals m two equals m. This expression in this special case becomes m. A squared over four plus m a squared r kya a over two a square over four m ठीक है a minus r क्या है a by two a minus r a by two a square over four So this is indeed the moment of inertia of a binary system with two identical masses. ठीक है? अब आप इसमें देखो, अगर हम इसको लिखना चाहें, some effective mass times some effective radius squared.
some effective mass and an effective radius squared. Can we, any moment of inertia can be written as some effective mass and some effective radius squared. And this effective radius squared can simply be the distance between these objects, A. Agreed? Now this composite system has a moment of inertia exactly given by this formula. And this can be written as some effective mass times the separation squared. Now what is this effective mass equal to? It's m over 2. So this effective mass is m over 2 for a binary system which has two identical masses. Alright. So if I have a heavy nucleus, capital M, and a very light electron, small m, and the separation between these is A, I can write the moment of inertia as some effective mass of the electron times A squared. Okay. Now please find out what mu is for this system. This is a heavy nucleus and a very light electron. A is the distance between the nucleus and the electron. right student has actually calculated this and you should do this on your own. The effective mass turns out to be equal to m m m plus m. Just use the same reasoning that I have hinted at here. Keeping in view the fact that r 
over A is small n. Okay. Just use this one by applying the principle of moments. So the effective mass or the reduced mass of the electron is given by this expression. If m approaches infinity, which was the assumption in Gober, that is, the mass of the nucleus is very large as compared to the mass of the electron, the effective ma reduced mass of the electron turns out to be m m over capital M, which is simply m, which is the true rest mass of the electron. And this is what Gober had used. So if we are to explain experimental facts, the wavelength that is emitted from an atom 1 over lambda is actually equal to z squared mu e4 divided by a h q c epsilon naught squared 1 over m i squared 1 over m m squared. So instead of using the true mass of the electron, one has to use the reduced mass of the electron. Okay? Because the nucleus does not really have an infinite mass. It does not have an infinite density. It is a finite mass. So if we compare the effective mass for a proton, the uh, for a for normal hydrogen, this is the effective reduced mass of an electron that exists in normal hydrogen, is given by mass of the electron into the mass of the nucleus, which is just the mass of the proton, divided by the mass of the electron plus the mass of the proton. Okay. The reduced mass of an electron in normal hydrogen is the mass of the electron multiplied by the mass of the proton, which is the nucleus, divided by their sum. Whereas the reduced mass of an electron, remember it's the reduced mass of an electron inside deuterium is given by the mass of the electron multiplied by two times by a mass of a proton and a mass of a neutron. Because there's a neutron inside the nucleus as well. Mass of a proton plus the mass of a neutron divided by Me plus Np plus the mass of a neutron. And the mass of a neutron and proton are almost the same. So the reduced masses of the electrons in normal hydrogen and deuterium are different. And that is why the and the ratio of these of the reduced masses, one can easily find the ratio Mp plus Mn, Me plus Mp plus Mn. Another kind of atom in which 
Inside the nucleus, you don't have a proton, but you have another particle, which is called a positronium. You have a particle, which is a positron. A positron is a positively charged particle with the same mass as the mass of an electron. So this is your nucleus, and you have an electron, which is negatively charged and has of course the mass of an electron revolving around this positron. So instead of having a proton at the center, you have a positron at the center. This kind of atom is called a positronium. Of course when you are doing spectroscopy with positronium, you cannot use the real mass of an electron because now the mass of the nucleus is, all, is exactly equal to the mass of the electron. You have to use a reduced mass, which is half the mass of an electron. So when you do spectroscopy with these artificial atoms, you have to use the correct reduced mass of the electron. There is another kind of atom that exists, and that is called a muonic atom, in which you have a new proton at the center, And you have another particle which is still lighter than the proton, but it is 273, 273, 273 times more massive than the electron. It's called a muon. It's negatively charged, and its mass is 273 times the mass of an electron. This is another kind of atom called a muonic atom. So spectroscopy with a muonic atom will give you totally different results from what you would expect from an electron inside a hydrogen atom. So these are the things that I wanted to cover as far as Bohr's model is concerned. In the next lecture, I would like to explain the origin of this angular momentum condensation condition and lead to what are called the matter series. See you on Wednesday.